One of the oldest civilizations to survive, China's long-term success can be accredited to its effort to harmonize its society at any cost. Oddly, it was the teachings of Confucius that helped China to devise horrendous and soul-tearing punishments that could make even stone-cold criminals wet their pants. Welcome to Nutty History, and today, let's find out what law and punishment were like in ancient China. Ancient Chinese Penal Code could also be called the Five Punishment System. That means China basically only had five types of punishments, and they were assigned to the crimes depending on the severity. There was no certainty about who conceptualized the idea of these five punishments, but the Chinese legends accredited to a famed warrior named Qiu. His specific clan was unknown, but many link him to the Hmong or their allies such as the San Mao or the Nine Li. Qi Yu in Chinese legends is regarded as a mythical king, and because five punishments were associated with him, the Xia dynasty implemented them during their rule. Before the Qin dynasty, the five punishments were mostly focused on branding the criminals. For petty thievery and pickpocketing, criminals were tattooed so they would bear the shame and disgrace of their crime for life. For major robbery and looting, amputation was the norm. Cutting off the nose was the most common degree of this punishment. The third and fourth punishments were also concerned with amputation. You may lose one or both feet, or if your crime was heinous enough, you may be punished by castration. And lastly, death was reserved for the gravest of crimes. In this version, women had their own separate set of five punishments. Again, the reason for a different set for women is not entirely known anymore, but it could be attributed to China being a patriarchal society where females weren't generally held responsible for their crimes, and it was believed that their tolerance capacity was lesser than that of a man. Women's five punishments were forced to grind grain, fingers squeezed between sticks, beaten with wooden sticks, forced to end their own lives, or in the harshest of cases, solitary confinement and sequestration. The first imperial law codes of a centralized Chinese state came about when the Shi Huangdi established autocratic rule as the first emperor of the Qin dynasty in 221 BC. Chen China was ruled by a school of thought known as legalism that believed humans were naturally evil. According to this philosophy, to create a harmonious society where the weak were safe, the laws had to be simplistic, ruthless, and efficient. The founder of legalism, Han Fizi, was an advocate of draconian laws and proposed that the ruler alone should possess the power, wielding his authority like lightning or thunder. He advocated the use of torture and enforced labor alike for punishment and asked the judge to not shy away from execution as well. Needless to say, following such oppressive laws didn't end well for the Qin dynasty, and they were usurped by the Hans in 206 BC. This is when Confucianism was introduced in the Reformed Constitution and the Penal Code of China. But legalism wasn't exactly shunned. Enough traces of it remained in the system to keep the punishment system cruel and unforgiving. After the introduction of the penal code based on legalism by the Qin dynasty and later the institution of Confucianism by the Han dynasty brought changes to the five punishment system. In the imperial era, five punishments were changed to bamboo lashes to the buttocks for petty crimes, stick lashes to the back, buttocks and legs for the repeated offense of petty crime, penal service for one to three years for standard crimes, exiled to a remote location such as the island of Hainan in the south, and lastly, death by strangulation, slicing, or decapitation, depending on the gravity of a horrendous crime. Within each punishment, there were different degrees. For example, a prisoner who was sentenced to be beaten with a light stick could be sentenced to up to five degrees of punishment, which dictated how many blows would be delivered. So a convict may get 10 to 15 beatings. The tenure of imprisonment could last for one to three years. Even exile was subject to degrees so that the more severe the crime, the farther the convict went afield. As for execution, a quick decapitation was considered worse than strangulation. Now, This may seem strange since strangulation is a slow and more painful form of death and their ultimate degree of capital punishment was all about killing them slowly, cut by cut. We know the section of this title may sound like an 80s kung fu movie, but this was the most menacing method of torture and punishment in China. During the 10th century, the five punishments evolved into more horrendous methods of penalties. Ling Qi, or death by a thousand cuts, could only be sentenced by the emperor's decree, and was used for the crimes of the highest degree in China called the Ten Abominations. 
The ten abominations revolved around the matters of treason, parricide, murder of spouse, rebellion, and witchcraft. Like other punishments, Ling Chi too had multiple degrees of punishment based on the severity of the crime. This gruesome punishment followed a prescribed order starting with the flaying of pieces of skin, muscles, and then removal of body parts to maximize pain but keeping the vital organs functioning. Commonly, Ling Chi consisted of 8 slices to the body, but it could go up to 120 slices. Yeah, calling this punishment death by a thousand cuts seems like false advertising, but hey, thousand? It does have a nice ring to it. The torturer would start with slicing the face, followed by hands, feet, chest, stomach, and the final blow was made at the heart or by decapitating. Western writers who witnessed Ling Chi in their lives described it as torture for the soul. It was meant to destroy the future of the offender's spirit so it cannot be recognizable in the afterlife. In the ancient Chinese judiciary process, judges and magistrates were treated with absolute authority and respect. Witnesses and the accused would be in a prostrate position before an official through the entire proceeding. The dread of being tortured loomed over the head of the accused even in court. The ancient Chinese authority had full confidence in this cruel and unwarranted system of justice, even though they knew that from time to time a wrongly tortured accused may give in and confess a crime despite being innocent. However, they advocated that the torture method to justice is highly efficient because it saved time and money by solving cases rapidly. As the criminal cases could be solved solely by accused confession, torture would be deployed from the get-go and became an integral part of the investigations. In ancient and imperial China, the verdict of any trial depended solely on the most important testimony of all, the accused themselves. According to the Chinese Penal Code, the accused could not be convicted without a confession. However, if you are thinking this was the perfect loophole in their judiciary, well, think again. Yes, one person could deny all charges as long as they want and not get punished despite damning evidence glaring in the face of the law. But this also meant that the authorities could use any method to extract a confession out of them as the case relied on it. Tying accused and witnesses around a pole by their arms during the hearing was a standard procedure in ancient Chinese courts. The guard would wind up the poles to twist their arms so the witnesses and accused won't dare to lie in their testimony. Due to the harsh treatment, witnesses were understandably reluctant to come forward. But if summoned, they would be dragged, kicking and screaming into the court. Don't want to be on that jury court. Often, the accused and reluctant witnesses would be restrained in a flat wooden framework that would be locked around a person's neck called a kang. The flatboard restraint would either be borne by the shoulders or used as the top lid of a wooden cage that was so small that the prisoner's feet could not quite touch the ground. This treatment would put extreme pressure on the neck of the prisoner and could end up strangling them. Often, the flatboard on the kang wasn't large enough so his hands could not reach his own mouth or he couldn't lie down, forcing the prisoner to require assistance to eat or drink. The accused would have to wear Kang all the time until the hearing reached its verdict, or longer if they were found guilty. Even if the accused were not kept in prison, authorities would still make them wear the Kang around their neck in public as a symbol of humiliation. One slightly less sadistic method of execution was the neck tower. The prisoner was put inside a Kang cage and he would have only stones to stand on. Every day a stone or two is removed so the poor prisoner would suffer a slow and horrendous death from strangulation. In the imperial administration, a senior official would dread the receipt of an imperial letter containing a piece of red silk as this had the clear meaning that the official was in severe disgrace and was expected to immediately hang or poison himself. Another method including pulling veins out of the back of the shins of the prisoner until he would bleed to death. Not all Chinese capital punishments were concerned with physical torture. The slow dropping of water was ceaseless mental anguish that might make prisoners cry for a quick death. This Chinese torture would include incessant and regular dropping of water on the forehead with the prisoner's body firmly strapped down providing no relief. If that wasn't enough, there were occasions when acid was occasionally also dropped that would painfully burn through the skin into the brain. This increased the terror as the prisoner would not know if the next drop would be water or acid. It has been reported through multiple media sources that modern China still often treats prisoners the same way as ancient and imperial China. In 2021, media outlets described how Chinese citizens are secretly seized, detained, 
and tortured frequently. Aside from these allegations, prisoners in China today may be subject to physical and sexual abuse, forced labor, and forced sterilizations. The United Nations is trying to engage the Chinese government on this serious human rights issue. So, what do you think could be done to stop such inhumane practices? Tell us in the comments. But if you're interested in more videos like this, then check out the rest of our punishment series. Don't forget to smash that like button, and as always, thanks for watching Nutty History.